Just how many people in this room have already seen Hereditary? Not, not that many, okay. So um, maybe they're running out directly after this to see it, so we won't spoil too much. Um, I was wondering how to start this, and I was going back through notes that I made in, this, in the follow-up conversation that we had the, to the interview that we had done. And you know, I, I was scribbling things down, and a lot of things don't get used, but um, I was looking back over notes, and I, I noticed that I had written down, gave birth to him while watching Fanny and Alexander. Oh. Is that true, <laughs> or did I make this up? <laughs> I did give birth to him while watching <laughs> Fanny. Uh, my my mom likes to tell me that she uh, w that she was in labor with Fanny and Alexander playing. I I'm not sure if that's I guess that's possible. I mean it, I I believe her. Um, um, and that's like one of my favorite films. So it's very it's strange. Um, so I clearly wanted to start at the beginning, which yeah. is why I brought that up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's when I knew I loved movies. <laughs> um, so, but another thing w you had mentioned was that Cries and Whispers was, was uh, Ingmar Bergman's film Cries and Whispers was a big influence. We're talking about the ways families deal with the death and mourning. So I'm actually really interested, before we get into the specifics of the film, or even of horror films, um, how you see... Um, like what filmmakers who one wouldn't necessarily think of as horror filmmakers were p influential on this film. Um, well, Ingmar Bergman is definitely important to me, um, and Cries and Whispers was a film that I screened for the crew. Um, you know, I, 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 I think it's maybe, it's, it's, for my money, maybe the best film I've ever seen about suffering, and, and one of the most painful films about death and sisterhood, not that I have any insight into that. Um, but um, yeah, and Hereditary is ultimately a film about suffering and one that um, <laughs> takes suffering seriously, um, or hopes to, tries to. Um, and uh, yeah, in some ways, Scenes from a Marriage was on my mind. Um, it just, there, there's a, a real, uh, emotional brutality to that film, but really to everything. I mean, there there are monologues I in in scenes from a marriage that are like so, or scenes from a marriage that are are so devastating. But like that, but that monologue seems to make it into every Bergman film. Like it's usually a man decimating a woman, um, and in this case, it's it's um, in in the case of Hereditary, there there are things said that can't be unsaid mm -hmm. that don't really mm -hmm. that you know it's it's people purging things but ultimately it doesn't really solve anything yeah the um, film at the uh, sorry the scene at the at the dinner table of course which you will see is um, probably for me maybe the scariest scene because of the way that the family in the way they interact and the way the mother talks to her son around grief and the the the, the refusals to actually deal with things in a direct way but just bringing it out as anger Right. Yeah. the 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 original cut of the film was much longer. Um, it was it was about three hours. There are about thirty scenes that are not in the uh, the film that's coming out today. Um, although I do I do consider this you know to be like the the definitive cut. But there were a lot more uh, <laughs> scenes of people avoiding communication and you know like somebody entering a hallway as a door closes, like scenes like that. Um, just kind of painstakingly chronicling the breakdown of communication. Um, but then uh, the, the original script and I, I guess the assembly cut um, had, uh, well, the, the dinner scene was actually a, 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 a three scene sequence that began at the dinner table and then um, continues in uh, in the bedroom with Annie and Steve arguing, and then continues into Peter's bedroom where Steve comes to console Peter. Um, and we, it, it it really just it we we found that it was m much more powerful to just to just end on that dinner scene and then have have the things that are said there like just hang in the air and and then 
I mean, the stuff that happens at the end of the film is, serves as sort of a payoff for like what isn't resolved there. There's something sort of radical, um, even in the cut that's out about the film, because it's it's a domestic drama, it's a family drama, it's all about family and the horrors of family, um, and you have these horror elements that kind of are gently sprinkled throughout. So the the idea of this three-hour family drama with even less horror because there's more family drama is sort of amazing to me. I hope it's something that we will get to see perhaps at some point. Yeah, I like to say, you know, one day you might be able to see just how boring this movie <laughs> can, ac can actually be. Um, yeah, it's funny because, <coughs> um, God, I, I'm going to repeat something I've been saying a lot lately. Um, I've, I've, I, was I was telling you earlier that I've like, I've, I've reached new levels of self-loathing, just hearing myself say the same thing over and over again. But the way I was, I was pitching the film when I was first taking it around was as a family tra tragedy that warps into a nightmare. Um, and I, you know, I, I really wanted it to be a slow build that like slowly, slowly, slowly ramps up. Um, and ultimately the movie tells you what it wants in the edit and either you listen to that or you don't to your peril. And it took me a while to give in and, and you know, prioritize pacing over, uh, you know, preciousness and, and, you know, loving this shot and not wanting to let it go or, you know, or feeling that, that like, you know, this, you know, knowing this helps this later, but ultimately hurts, hurts pacing and hurts rhythm and, and anyway. Um, so now the ramp up is much more accelerated and everything we did lose uh, w was ultimately in, in the service of character development. Um, and so all the horror stuff is, is there, none of that left because it was all kind of essential to the story. Mm. Um, but, um, but it's funny because things that really felt necessary in the script suddenly feel tacked on in a cut when, when you have actors uh, imbuing these things, into, you know, into their performance. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, w another uh, one of the things that you had talked about with me earlier, also, uh, and it was in relation to Bergman saying "Cries and Whispers," but in many other films, was what scares you the most in terms of um, s film style is artifice. And this I, this was really interesting to me. Um, that there are filmmakers who, because everything is so super mannered and styled in a certain way, that from an early age you had a very visceral, almost horror response to it, even though they're not horror films. Yeah, well, I think it began with me just being really upset by kitsch. Um, like, as a kid, like, The Wiz just <laughs> horrified me. Um, well, the Wiz is really scary. The Wiz is uh, just a nightmare. Um, <laughs> in fact, The Wiz is still... It, it's very hard to scare me. I'm not. I'm not going to watch The Wiz. Um, <laughs> and re and Return to Oz. Did anybody see the re a Return to Oz? Ugh. That was traumatic. Yeah. yeah it's. Uh, I mean, the, it opens <laughs> with Dorothy getting electroshock treatment. Yeah. It's kind of. It's kind of. It's really ballsy, actually. Wait. Somebody interesting directed that. It was like. I think it's Walter Murch. I was going to say Walter Murch. Yeah, okay, then it must be, because I was gonna, I, I was afraid to... Yeah. Famous sound designer did Apocalypse Now. I don't know how many, how many films he made. This might have been, was it his only film? What's I don't know. I'm gonna, we'll cut that out later, yeah. in case I'm wrong. No, no, I, I, I was gonna say Walter Murch, so I, if we're both wrong, that would be fascinating. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, and, and just, and, you know, camp bothered me, but then... There were certain films growing up that really, really just insinuated themselves into my consciousness. Uh, and the, the thing that kind of links them all is that they're all, they, they're all very, very brazen about their use of artifice. Um, Peter Greenaway is the big one. Um, the Cook, the Thief, His Wife and Her Lover was something I saw when I was w like way too young. I think I was like 13. Um, and my dad had talked about it scaring him. And my dad, you know, never talked about anything scaring him. Um, a lot of movies piss him off, but like that, <laughs> but that one really bothered him. Um, what so was it about that film that scared both of you? Well, I never even talked talked to him about it because I snuck the movie. Like I was, I was going out to rent my movie on Friday after school, and I snuck. I I, I put 
uh, the Cook the Thief into like you know into another movie's co- like VHS cover. It was like Encino Man or something. And then, um, and, uh, and then I, I proceeded to watch a movie that I would regret watching for the next <laughs> four years. Um, and, uh, and then, I, like two years later, I, I like worked up the nerve to watch uh, a bootleg copy be- because it's not available in the States of The Baby of Macon, mm-hmm. um, oh. uh, it, which is... Uh, even more horrible, um, but uh, um, yeah, there's some. I mean, there's something about like the sickly theatrical lighting that he got from Sasha Vierney, and you know, and and just uh, especially in The Cook, the Thief, what he does with production design and costume design, um, where um, you know every room is kind of color coded. It's it's either like deep red or deep white, um, or uh, or like. G- g- neon vomit green mm-hmm. and you'll have these tracking shots um, where you follow characters from one room to another and in one room they're wearing a green suit for the, the for the kitchen which is green and then when they enter the uh, the red room it, um, their their colors somehow become red and it's a very it, it has a this nightmarish um, power um, I, I also I mean his, that that film also bothers me and, and many others by him because he he does strike me as an authentic misanthrope mm-hmm. who like is is like you know kind of disgusted by the human body and obsessed you know by decay and um, and, and but, but then also like you feel that he's also kind of disgusted by the human condition. Like it just, like he, he I don't know. I, I'm, I, he, he's a very clinical filmmaker um, who, who's like, who's working with stories about cruelty, but, but it, it, the, the, there's this like godlike omniscient perspective that just like feels nothing for these people. Um, but maybe irritation that, that they're not being harmed <laughs> further. So would you consider that something that frightens you more than something that influences you? Because Hereditary is a film that feels like it cares deeply about its characters. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd want to make a film that feels like The Cook, The Thief, but that film was just so vivid for me um, that I, I find myself I, I, I'm that that I just became fascinated by it, and I just find that I, I keep <laughs> referencing it indirectly, um, and uh, and I don't know how to make a horror movie without thinking of that film, or without thinking of the other film that scared me as a kid, which was Carrie, which is actually a very empathetic film. Yeah, kind of I the mean, opposite. It took me years to watch it again when I was a kid that film really bothered me. The images from that film, like, I, I, they, they, they followed me around. Um, but I watched it again recently and I was really surprised to see just how campy it was. And I shouldn't have been, I shouldn't have been surprised because that's like Brian De Palma. Um, yeah, it's like this deeply sorrowful um, and deeply campy um, horror comedy I don't know. It's it, yeah. Th- that's an amazing film. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, growing up. Uh, I watched Carrie a lot, but I always wanted to turn the video off bef- before the pig's blood dropped. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is kind of a strange thing because you're waiting for this catharsis the whole film, but then when the film delivers it, it's kind of like the wrong catharsis. Right. Well, because yeah, I mean, he he takes such care to make sure that we are. Uh, in total sympathy with her, um, she is such a sympathetic character, and but she's also an irritating character because she she's such a victim, and we just want her to f- fucking like do something, and then she does it, and it's it it like <laughs> it's it's a betrayal. Um, yeah, uh, Hereditary seem it's similar in a way. I mean, you you kind of draw people in, ask for the ask for the audience's sympathy, and then you. Betray them. <laughs> I think. Yeah. No. No. I mean. I. Yeah. The. Yeah. The ending is pretty apocalyptic and in, in hereditary. Um, 
things do not work out for anybody. <laughs> I, I, actually, that's not true. Um, I don't want to, nobody in here has seen the film, it seems, so I'm not going to say anything, but I will say that it is a success story in, in some ways. I so agree with that. It's a happy ending for somebody. <laughs> actually, for multiple people. It depends on what plane we're talking about, what plane of awareness. <laughs> yeah. But yes, you're totally right. Um, okay, to move on from that, because I know that I'll say something really spoilery if I keep talking about that. Um, I was really fascinated also to learn that you um, are a huge Mike Lee fan, yeah. which, I, which I suppose does kind of tie back into the idea of the film as uh, like a family drama or a film about uh, people and how they interact. And um, I remember you had talked about another year being something that sort of profoundly moved and disturbed you. Oh yeah, Another Year is really amazing. You're watching a movie about a happy couple um, with a happy son <laughs> um, and a sad friend, like a doomed woman who's responsible for her own like unhappiness. It's, uh, it, yeah, that's an amazing film. Um, Mike Lee, yeah, I mean, M Mike Lee is just an inspiration to me. He's, I mean, I don't know how he even could be an influence, given that like nobody can work the way that he does. Um, I mean, any insight I have is is from what I've read. Um, but you know, he works for six months, right, with actors like the best actors in England, which I guess means the best actors in the world, right? And and he 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 does these like very elaborate improvisations. Um, and builds these histories and and uh, these dynamics between these people um, that become incredibly lived in because in fact they are. Um, and then he goes off and writes a script and then he makes a film and it's a masterpiece almost every time around. And even when he was working only for the BBC and making TV movies, they are like better than anything. Um, and people never really talk, I mean, it, he, People get so caught up in how um, vividly realized his like character work is that that they often forget to just talk about him as a craftsman, and he's just a fucking great filmmaker. Um, his work with Dick Pope is like amazing, and I, yeah, from the production design to the music in his films, like yeah, he's yeah he's really exciting to me. Um, yeah. I mean, well, w I mean, one of the reasons I, I bring it up is because I am interested in your work with the actors in the film, especially for um, a debut feature. It's extremely impressive, and I'm sure that most people here, even if you haven't seen the film, have been hearing about all the talk that Tony Collette's been getting. Um, much deserved. And not just her. Alex Wolf is amazing in the film. There's a, a lot of great performances, um, but they're very emotionally raw performances. And I'm, uh, how did you work with these amazing actors on your first film? Like, w how did you get to that place with them? I mean, <clears throat> it's all really in the script. Um, so I, I really feel like the work I did there was in the writing. Um, and then I, I, I cast the film and, and, and I ha luckily had you know, very intelligent actors who knew what was required and they came equipped. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm somebody who, um, I compose a shot list before I really talk to anybody in the crew because I, I just, I need to see the movie in my head before I can really talk about what's needed. Um, and then I'll, I'll sit down with my cinematographer, P um, Pavel Pogorjelski, who I've been working with since uh, I went to AFI, um, and, uh, and my production designer, Grace Yuen, who's wonderful. Um, and, uh, and I'll take them through the shot list, shot by shot. Um, and that's a process that took about three weeks, five hours a day. Um, and then we all have the movie in our head, um, and then we're, 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 and so we're all working towards that, and, and then we have a dialogue about that movie that you know, and 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 the you know the shot list gets better and everything gets better, and but um, but part of that is you know the blocking is kind of worked out then, so in that way I you know I I I've blocked the movie out, and that can be somewhat constraining to the actor. Or at least I think it's 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 constraining if you've done it, uh, if you've if you've 
done it poorly, and sometimes you find out you have. Um, but um, but you try to I I try tr try to block things out in a way that like frees the actor to do what the scene uh, requires of them. Um, and but then also for them to find something new. Um, but um, that's really the work with the actor. It, or, or that's my work with the actor. It's it's um, first like imagining a film and imagining a performance and, and mapping out blocking um, for the script I've written, and then and then giving them the script, and then later on giving them the blocking. So you have I mean so there's I mean there's a lot of uh, a lot of detail, a lot of planning, but then a certain amount of that rigidity it sounds like, from what you're saying, sort of has to go away once the actors are in the space. It's not like, you know, as an extreme example, like stories about the way Terrence Davies works on set, right, where he's had some, he works in a very particular way, everything, everything has to be the exact shot that he has had in his head from the beginning, and some actors find it very constraining. And we've talked about Terrence Davies, and I, I love Terrence Davies, but you feel that. I mean, his, his films are... Um, you know, he works with tableaus, and and um, and that's part of the beauty of his work. Um, they're they're very singular films, um, especially uh, distant voices, still lives, and and long day closes. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, no, you you have to be fluid about it, and you have to you and, and you have to be able to. Um, throw things away if they're not working, uh, at, and especially if they're not working for the actor. Um, but I I find production to be like not a very creative time. You know, it's very stressful. Um, there were days where we wh where we had to get shoot ten, twelve scenes a day, um, and um, and so you're just racing. Um, and and when you're racing like that, I find that I am just l leaning sometimes blindly on my plans. Um, so, yeah. And did, I mean, did you feel the same way from your early shorts? I, I, I wonder um, if, if anyone in the room, if you haven't seen Hereditary, perhaps you've seen any of his early shorts, um, because I strongly recommend his first film, The Strange Thing About the Johnsons, um, and I don't think I want to tell you what happens in it <laughs> if you haven't seen it, but it's one of those... Um, genuine jaw droppers, and I don't think that there are that many of those. That's, it's a term that people use, I really made my jaw drop, but this actually will make your jaw drop. You're just like, this can't be what I'm watching. Um, so, but, but even from that early film, there was, there was a very distinct style to it in, in the way you were working with actors. I don't necessarily see, it is the same as Hereditary, but the way that you're placing people in front of the camera, the way you're dealing with compositions. Well, <coughs> I mean, that, that is, and a lot of my shorts are, are are movie movies, right? Like that is very much um, a tongue-in-cheek like update on the Circean melodrama, um, or like a perversion of the Circean melodrama. But uh, but I mean, even if you look at what Cirque was doing then, like it was very subversive. Um, so really, just an update. Um, um, I think, uh, but then, but then you remove the tongue from the cheek just enough to confuse everybody. Um, yeah, that's a, that, that's a, a, um, uh, yeah, that, that's a melodrama about, uh, or really like a soap opera, like a, like a, an overripe <laughs> Soap opera about a, uh, a a son who is molesting his father. Um, okay, well, there you go. I wasn't going to give it away. But it, was, it was. It's. It was. I made it in a different climate. Um, <laughs> what the difference eight years make? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so I was thinking more about a strange thing about the Johnsons and your short uh, Munchausen, um, or Munchausen depends on who's saying it, I guess. Um, which are both movies about um, control and families and like how families keep up appearances and how they feel the need to kind of control their environments and Hereditary has so much of that as well. I'm wondering, with this through line that I've seen threaded through your films about family, do you, um, do you see this as like a grand theme that, you, that you're exploring as a filmmaker? Well, 
in some way those films, those shorts are, I mean, they're pretty academic and they're kind of like about de- like, you know, idealized American depictions of families. Like Munchausen has a lot of like Norman Rockwell Americana like about it. You know, it's also, it's also like, it, it's, it, it's, it's meant to look like a live action Disney movie, but, but then like the content like, um, darkens into something else, but the aesthetics like don't bother acknowledging that. Um, but, um, and so I, I wanted this to be less academic in that sense. Um, you know, I want, I want Hereditary to be, in, in that way I think Hereditary actually like owes a greater debt to the, uh, the melodrama than, um, than to the horror film, but, but, e- but even maybe more than more than uh, um, the Johnsons does because it 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 I I think it aims to be well first it does aim to be an unabashed horror movie and I hope it I I hope it's a really good horror movie um, but I but it it also it is um, kind of in that melodramatic melodramatic tradition of. You know, it, 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 it's about people going through extreme emotions, and the film kind of aims to be as big as those emotions. It kind of, it, it, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's expressionistic in the same way that, like, I, I, that I think, you know, my favorite melodramas are, in that the form really strives to, like, match the content. Um, and so, you know, the idea with Hereditary was to make a film that like functioned first as uh, um, a family drama about people going through very horrible things and trying to navigate their way through grief and loss, um, but then not being able to, and the movie ends up kind of collapsing under the weight of everything they're trying and failing to carry. I don't know. Um, it, it strikes me, just hearing what you're saying about um, camp and artifice and those things having skewed you growing up that strange thing about the Johnsons and Munchausen actually are that they achieve that and um, but hereditary has a slightly more realist um, tone to it like you you say that there there are a certain amount of melodrama to it but actually while you're watching it um, there's no distance as a viewer you you become quite involved in these people's lives so when these terrible things happen it hits you on a very gut level were you con- kind of consciously moving away from that camp aesthetic that you had more in your shorts? Yeah, I was. Um, I, I didn't want this to feel like a movie movie. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I didn't want this to be... Um, uh, it, it, it's funny, because I didn't, but then at the same time, the film is, like, packed with horror conventions and tropes and, like, cliches. And I feel like that's part of the joy of working in genre is that like the task is always to breathe new life into a dead horse um, because the formula is like it's set and if you're going to deviate from the formula so much that you're uh, that, that that you're avoiding cliches at all costs like I, you 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 it, it, it kind of ceases to be a genre film somehow um, and so um, but anyway to answer your question, I did I did want the film to be grounded in, I guess, our reality as opposed to a movie reality. But at the same time, you know, we 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 built um, the entire house on a stage, um, so everything interior in the Graham house was built from scratch. Um, and one reason we did that, beyond the fact that we wanted to remove walls and we needed and we wanted to you know create spaces that would accommodate a dolly and a lot of camera movement was that we were going for this dollhouse aesthetic. Um, and we did want to kind of dwarf this family and their environment at different times. And, and, um, and it, was, it, it was important to me that, that, the, that the house begin as a home, albeit like a, a, a fraught one, you know, that was already troubled from the beginning but then gradually become increasingly unhomelike. Um, yeah. And um, uh, you had also said that the way that, the, the method around building the literal dollhouses in the film sort of had a lot to do with how the larger 
built uh, set was built, which I found really interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it became a logistical nightmare, um, and we we knew it would, but we didn't. But I don't know. It it we 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 learned like a lot of obvious lessons that just weren't obvious to us, um, because we, you know, we were building. Uh, well, first before we were building anything, we were you know designing this house to be built in Park City on a, on a soundstage. But then we also had a miniaturist, Steve Newburn, who also did the prosthetics for the film in Toronto, who was waiting for our designs so that he could start replicating them. Um, and so what that, you know, so that means that he's not just waiting for, you know, like what are the dimensions of, of the space, you know, like what, what, what are, are, are the dimensions of the rooms and, you know, what, what, what uh, you know, what, what's this like frame that I'm building, but um, what, what kind, you know, what, what, it, what does the wood paneling look like? What is the wallpaper? What are the drapes over the windows? Like, are there plants in any of these rooms? Like, what, what are those plants? Um, and, and then like, are, what, what are they potted in, right? Um, and like, um, what, what, uh, what's the blanket on the bed, you know, et cetera. Um, and like, are there posters on the wall? If, you know, if so, get those rights now, you know? Um, and, um, and so, you know, we made sure that we got him the, uh, you know, the dimensions and everything right away. And it's like, well, that's, we can do that you know, in a weekend, like we need, we need the dressing. Um, so we ended up having to settle on the dressing of the house, like month, like a, cu a couple months um, in advance of of shooting these things. Um, and uh, and so it it, it 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 was so tight and so hectic that we actually had the miniatures coming in, like the day that we were shooting them, and we had pushed all of that material to the very end of the shoot. Um, so all the scenes with Tony Collette in the dollhouses, those those were the last things that you shot, basically yeah. for the film. That was that was, that was well, the so final people week. who haven't seen it again. Like th these, this dollhouse aesthetic is very central to the film. It's not just um, like a throwaway thing. It's kind of this thematic thing that ties the movie together visually. Yeah. Um, and there are scenes that are gone that are not in the movie with with uh, miniatures that you know are never seen. Which is, which is so depressing. Which we'll see, again, which we'll see, I hope. But we'll see those scenes. Maybe, I don't know. Um, to, uh, I, when I think of that, I think of The Shining. Um, I can't help, obviously, um, I, I, I do believe that The Shining, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks this, is probably the most aesthetically influential yeah. film of the last 40 years. I don't even think just horror film, probably any American film. Um, I think that's just come to pass. And that happens with movies that are roundly rejected when they first came out, right? It was just so radical. People hated The Shining when it came out. It was just too radical. And now every movie people wants to be The People hated Night of the Hunter when, in, when that first came out. People and hated Peeping Tom. And Vertigo. Yeah. Um, Vertigo was disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> just didn't follow that movie. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, it just has such an upsetting Wait, ending. so it's the same woman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. She's Carlotta, <laughs> and why should I care? It's probably what they're <laughs> yeah. thinking. Um, but I bring up The Shining because in The Shining you do you do have this um, th this famous scene where Jack Nicholson's um, standing over the model of the hedge maze, and then of course there's the real hedge maze. And I thought of that a lot while um, while I was watching the film. And I'm saying that it was a direct reference or anything, but The Shining aesthetic being so important to horror filmmakers, I'm wondering. As someone who doesn't necessarily consider himself a horror filmmaker per se, even though you've made a great one, are and there? I, and I love the horror genre, and I and I and this is a horror movie, and I'm proud of that. You know, yes, so. of course. But I'm wondering if there were actual, are there horror filmmakers that you do find uh, have to have been influential? Oh yeah, um, I mean, Nicholas Rogue. Um, don't Look Now is an obvious touchstone. Um, I love Walkabout. I love Bad Timing. Insignificance is cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, Insignificance is great. Um, and what, what, 
what what he did with montage was like really radical, especially for somebody who like you and I talked about this, but for somebody who began as a cinematographer, um, he he really had the the heart of 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 an editor. Um, uh, just he was really brutal with um, with with his images, and but he also f he 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 like developed this style where like he he he. Uh, he, he crafted these montages where there were these like s psychic connections between images that were. I, I, it's very hard to talk about what he did because um, it's a tonal thing more than anything. But um, he, he was pretty remarkable. And then um, uh, Roman Polanski, like early Polanski, um, I, I would say from Repulsion to Chinatown. So like Repulsion, Cul de Sac, Rosemary's Baby, Macbeth. And Chinatown so are like you're leaving out the tenant quite specifically. I am. Well, it. I think the tenant gets better or worse based on like the dubbing you're watching it with. Um, but um, but I I do love the tenant. But I, I I think it's like just like a notch below those. And I think Tess is like just a, a notch below those. And I love those films too. I, I I love Oliver Twist. I think people should talk about Oliver Twist. That's a good um, one. Good. Um, a lot of craft it's and really all of our twists. Yeah. Um, but, te you know, t Tess is a good one to bring up because there's a lot of that kind of stately, disturbing, detached artifice in that film, too, that kind of stuck with me a lot when I saw it young. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of artifice. It's, it's, a, re it's, a, it, it, it's a really weird movie because, I mean, I, I, or it, I think it is because... Nastasha Kinski is like not sympathetic. She's like there. She's such a like a, or well, there's like she's like a this weird vessel onto which you could project so many things. Um, but she, but I I, it it's it's meant to be a you know this Thomas Hardy tragedy, um, but I I yeah I I really like don't feel anything watching it. Ex but I, I except for like total admiration for the craft. On display, um, and it feels like it was. It feels like that that was a deliberate choice to have her be um, this like blank uh, mm -hmm. uh, ve vessel. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, well, you know a lot about vessel, blank vessels. But that's just one little thing I'm going to say without spoiling anything. Um, oh, see how right. I keep kind yeah. of getting little <laughs> spoilers good. in there without saying anything. Teasing. Um, we had also talked Spoil. about. Um, so uh, just going back to some horror filmmakers, um, the fact that you know Romero and Toby Hooper died right next to each other, and there's uh, it, within horror filmmakers are horror lovers. There tends to be you're more of one or the other, um, and it, it was interesting saying that you love Romero's films, but you don't consider yourself necessarily a Romero guy. No, I kind of find them to be like a, a little dull on an aesthetic level and i i but i i like i i see the importance and i i really admire them i i really i mean like um dawn of the dead is pretty fantastic um but yeah i i don't know i don't i don't think about him much and i i think i i, I think i actually need to revisit him um and then toby hooper you know i i do i love texas chainsaw massacre and i really love Poltergeist. Um, that's that's just like a fun time. Yeah, that's like that's, yeah. that's one of the, is the film that I've seen more than any other film in history. Yeah, I, I get <laughs> it. I mean, it's like it's it just happened really that way. Good. I just started watching it at an early age, and I think I've seen Poltergeist about ninety-five times. I watched it for the first time when I was like twenty-five. Really? I, I avoided it for some reason. I think my mom hated it. I think my mom like I think I was in a video store with my mom once, and she was like, Ugh, Poltergeist. Which actually brings Sorry. me to a question. Uh, you also had a very, this, this thing that I connected to very strongly when talking to you, you had a strong bond with your mother as a, as a movie watcher. Like she was showing you things at an early age that were you know, yeah. perhaps inappropriate for a kid. I went through that experience too. Yeah, well, yeah, no, I, 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 I really did. My, I mean, my, 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 one of my mom's favorite films is Defending Your Life, and like she got me on that. And she got me on that train. I love defending your life. Um, but um, a lot of my favorite films are, are things I saw for the first time with my mother, and we both react, we both like 
responded very strongly to these films. Like, you know, Mulholland Drive was a big deal. We watched that together. P- <laughs> P- piano Teacher was like really big. I think I was 15 or 14 when that, that is when extremely I inappropriate. <laughs> We we loved it. That was great. It's great. I love I, it too. I think the big the big two were Dogville, um, which I think is maybe the best movie of the last twenty years. I love Dogville. Um, I know it's not popular to like Lars von Trier right now, <laughs> and I and I haven't seen the house that Jack built. Um, and I am a bigger fan of his older like well his like mi- middle stuff like everything from The Kingdom, which might be still his best thing ever. Um, the two seasons of The Kingdom and, you know, Breaking the Waves and the Idiots and Dance in the Dark all the way up to Dogville um, and maybe Manderley. Um, and then what What else? Oh, and Songs from the Second Floor was a film I saw with my mom and that, that like, that changed my life. I, I, I love that film so much and I can't wait to see what Roy Anderson is doing next. I know that there's one vignette with Hitler in a bunker. I, that's going to be cool. <laughs> From from Roy Anderson, that's going to be exciting, and it, it, and you know with with Sweden's history, you know. Roy Anderson is somebody who I think also like with with in terms of art cinema of the past fifteen years, say has had an incredible influence on m- almost all filmmakers. Without those film without people knowing that he's that influential, like I would say, you could talk to most people and they won't know who Roy Anderson is, but I think that what he's done in cinema has just like filtered its way down into almost everybody's work. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's he's almost like a parody of an obsessive perfectionist, you know? His films like take several years to make because, I mean, they are, anybody who's seen them knows that they're like uh, uh, basically a series of of, like one-shot vignettes, Um, but he, Builds a set around where the camera will be, um, and it's it's always beautifully composed. Every shot is like just this in, this immaculate painting, um, and he's also what he's doing with like with matte paintings. Um, sometimes like these sets seem to like just you know extend to the vanishing point. Um, it I don't know. In some ways, he makes me think of Powell and Pressburger, and just like you know, he's he's bringing back that you know that. That 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 um, the meticulousness mm. um, of in you know of in in production design that I you know that I I, I want more of. Um, well, <coughs> I'm I, I would say bec- considering the amazing accomplishment of of this film and all these influences and people that you admire, I'm very excited to see what you're going to do next. Um, is there anything that you can divulge about your next project? <clears throat> um, well, I shouldn't actually be here right now. I'm here for the uh, the release of Hereditary, um, and it's been amazing to do that. But I, I'm I'm in production. I'm in pre-production for a film I'll be shooting in August um, in Hungary, and Hungary is is serving for Sweden. So it's a it's a movie set in Sweden. Um, and I, what can I say? It, it's a it's like it's it's an apocalyptic breakup movie. <laughs> that sounds great. Also, it all <laughs> it all comes back to Sweden. I'm um, see this conversation came completely full circle. Came back to Bergman in Sweden. Yeah, yeah. The film that birthed you. Yeah, the film. Yeah, the film. <laughs> the, f- the film. The yeah, the film that that brought me into this world. Going back to the womb with your next <laughs> film. See, I'm writing all the ad copy for you. <laughs> Um, I wanted to make sure we had time to take some questions from the audience. Yep. Hi, Ari. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to seeing Hereditary tonight. Thank you. Um, has your MFA degree from AFI influenced your career path in any way? And if so, uh, is a directing degree from AFI uh, beneficial in any way for you as a filmmaker? I mean... I don't know if there's anything more worthless than a directing degree. Um, <laughs> but I can say that I am really grateful for my time at AFI. Um, AFI really, like, it, they, it, it, there's no real theory, you know, there. It's like, it, it's practice. And you go there and you study a discipline. Um, every year there are 
um, 28 directing fellows, 28 writing fellows, 28 um, producers, 28 cinematographers, and then 14 editors and 14 production designers. And so you're all working together on what are called cycle films the first year, and you make three of those. Um, and then you screen each of them for the school, and then you sit up on a stage and they tear you apart. Um, and based on how you know um, strong or poor your film was, um, you you get who you get for the next for the next cycle. Um, and people want to work with you know the people who are you know making good stuff, and people like avoid the others like the plague. Um, and so it's very competitive, and it can be brutal. Um, and then and then the second year you make a thesis film, you make one. Or if you're the editors, or if you're an editor or a, a production designer. You're you're doing two of these for each, um, because there are half as many of you. Um, I was lucky in that I was able to do some weird shit there, and I, I, um, and um, I was able to experiment with different styles. You know, I I'm ultimately you know just like I love movies. Like that's why I'm making movies is because I want to be in dialogue with them. Um, and um, and so that was an, that was my time to like basically rip off different people and see what was me. Um, and, you know, like I love Michael Haneke, and I I tried my, my like you know I tried to do that. I tried to do my you know kind of like um, minimalist provocation. You know, where I don't move the camera, and I you know, and it it's very clinical, and um, and um, I you know I. I didn't enjoy making or wa watching what I had done, um, and then I tried. And then I tried to do, you know, I don't know, like whatever. Um, the next guy that I have, you know, always loved, um, and um, and so by the time I got around to the strange thing with the Johnsons, which was my thesis film, I, you know, I I was starting to get a grip on, you know, on on what my style was. Um, and I met uh, my cinematographer, Pavel Pogorjelski, who's also one of my best friends there. Um, you know, I, 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 I met a producing friend named Alejandro de Leon, who, you know, who I work with a lot, you know? Um, and uh, I, yeah, I just met a lot of people that I'll, I'll be working with for a, lot of, for a long time, and um, it, it was a great experience. Um, but ultimately, when you leave, like you're you're out in the wilderness, and and if anything, you're a little bit more equipped for that because AFI kind of aims to replicate the the cutthroat nature of that environment. Do you mind my asking how they responded to strange thing about the Johnsons when you first showed it to AFI? Well, you know, so AFI has um, every time every. When you first go to AFI, there's this there there's the um, oh, what do you call it the you know the first assembly uh, um, <laughs> uh, orientation, orientation. Uh, and they'll show you and they'll show you some of the films that they're proudest of and and um, and you know and and I found that there that that some of them were like you know, they're often very politically correct and you know they're they're kind of like Oscar movies you know where they're like about issues and. <laughs> You know, like so, they'll be like in like an inner city school, or or you know, and they're about apartheid. But you know, they're made by I don't know, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> people going to AFI. Um, and uh, and there's something almost apologetic about them. And I I, I just thought like, what's the worst thing I can do here? Um, <laughs> and I thought like, oh, like a, a son molesting his dad. No, nobody should make that movie. Um, <laughs> Like, how do I make that compelling? Um, and uh, and what happens is that y you submit thesis scripts anonymously, um, so anybody can do it. Uh, an editor can do it, a production designer. Um, and about 130 were, were submitted, and, and then um, the faculty greenlights them. And I and somehow the strange thing with the Johnsons was greenlit. Um, but what they didn't, what wasn't spelled out in the script. And already there were, I think, like one or two faculty members who were like, "I'll resign <laughs> if, 
Um, but what wasn't laid out in the script was that the, f the family was going to be African American. Um, and the reason for that was because uh, in undergrad, my, my, like one of my best friends and, 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 and just was an actor who who was who happened to be African American, uh, named Brandon Greenhouse, and I really wanted to cast him, um, and so that's how it started. It's like, okay, well, if he's black, then the family is black, um, and it's very in a t it's totally incidental that they're black. Like, I'm not. This is not a political film, but then this argument broke out about whether or not that was okay, um, and then it became a really interesting argument to me, where it's like, okay, well. But I like this script, and I think these are interesting parts, and I'm giving interesting parts to, you know, like a black cast. And that, that like, but otherwise, you know, it, it, it is, it's apolitical, and of course you can't say that, because then it becomes political the minute that the, the, the argument breaks out and I, I continue to proceed, uh, or I decide to proceed. Um, but it, it became an interesting argument, and, and and it just it also just felt right. It just felt right for the film. Um, but ultimately, um, the the race of the family was incidental. And we, that film had a dollhouse aesthetic too. I mean, it 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 it's really like rooted in a reality that is f so far away from this one. But um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so it u ultimately the answer is the. I think AFI is actually proud of that film, and it, it, um, I, I've heard that they show it to incoming um, fellows <laughs> uh, as, like, as an example of like, you know, look, look at what you can do here. Like, <laughs> we, don't, we don't care. <laughs> uh, well, it made its yeah. way around the festival. So it played the New York Film Festival. It did, I, and that was a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. And then not long after that, it was leaked online in like the worst possible way, um, but. Yeah, and now it has a very interesting life online. Times you live in. Any other questions? Where did you watch it? Where? Well, there are a lot of really bad, badly embedded, um, like YouTube, uh, uh, but they look terrible. Um, go, go, go to Vimeo, uh, and uh, and you can find a pretty good, uh, pretty good version of that. Yeah, I think it's on my website too. Question back there. So I'm very interested in this film, but I'm not a horror person. I actually actively stay away from horror, and I sort of break those rules sometimes for films like The Witch, because I wanted to see the Puritan kind of worldview manifest, and I br broke that rule for Get Out. It sounds like a lot has to do with family and, and in, in your, and I wonder if you, and you haven't really talked much about that. I mean, I wonder whether the kind of your, your and both, the way you've talked about the dysfunction, this film is about that, but at the same time, your parents are seem very profound influences. I wonder if you can talk a bit about how the film, uh, without asking for spoilers, if your thoughts around some of these questions. Well, um, so. When I first like endeavored to write a horror movie, because I, you know, I, I kind of avoided it for a while as well. Um, I, I, you know, I, I had to ask myself, well, okay, so like, what are my fears? What am I afraid of? Um, and you know, when I think back on my, you know, my my worst nightmares, like the nightmares that affected me the most deeply. Um, you know, like those nightmares that once you have them, you have them again because then you can't get it out. Um, they're they're usually around somebody in my family dying or somebody in my family changing or becoming like a double of themselves, um, somebody I don't recognize, or they're around me inadvertently, um, or maybe even deliberately doing something that um, that harms somebody else that's close to me. And then I have to live with the guilt of that, um, and I—I I don't know. It—it it just struck me as a no-brainer to like to to go to the home <laughs> um, if I'm going to make a horror movie, um, and I wanted to make an existential horror film, like a film about fears that don't have remedies, like the fears that 
like really plague us and like un until we die or we come to terms with them somehow. Um, I haven't. Um, uh, and so that's my, that, that's, I, I think that, that, yeah, that's where this film really comes from. And, you know, the beautiful thing about genre filmmaking is that you can take personal material or, you know, uh, bleaker material, um, like really something that's very difficult, um, and you put it through this filter and out comes this work of invention. Um, and, you know, what makes it a genre film is, is really just that you had to find the catharsis in that story, um, which is fun and, it, and, and can be therapeutic. Um, yeah. I think we would have time for just one more question right here. Um, so there was a recent interview with Toni Collette where she said that you're the most prepared director she's ever worked with. And so <laughs> I know you talked about making a shot list, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to your, your pre-production process. Um, well, I mean, the shot list is really the key. Um, because in order to make the shot list, you, you have to map out the blocking, and you're mapping out what you're, what, what's in the frame, right? So you're, you're mapping out the mise-en-scene. Um, and when you're building, you know, um, your most important location on a stage, that's very helpful, um, like, from an economic perspective, because we know, okay, we're going to be seeing this wall, um, but we're kind of neglecting this wall. And we'll see it maybe, you know, may maybe a couple times, but we don't have to spend money there. Oh, okay, yeah, let's see. We're gonna be in this room. Are we gonna be seeing the ceiling? No, let's not build a ceiling. Um, uh, so one, that just, that just helps because we, we had a limited budget here. I had, you know, amazing resources for a first film and I uh, am incredibly fortunate. Um, but still, this is a small, a, a small film, relatively speaking. Um, and so, um, so that way you can, you know, kind of get the most out of your budget. Um, but uh, I don't know. I'm just I I'm very neurotic, and I'm obsessed with like worst case scenarios. That's how I end up writing stuff like this. Um, <laughs> It's usually just so I can like give myself a break and inflict horrible things on like fictional characters as opposed to like project like projected future s selves, you know. Um, but um, but I just you know it's fucking terrifying to show up on, on a set with a bunch of people waiting to be told what to do, and I, I so I over prepare. Um, and then I find that I'm that you know oh, you can never really over prepare. Um, you're always a little bit under prepared. Um, so I don't know. Uh, it the for me the shot list is the key um, because it just allows us to talk in a much more um, specific way. We're not talking about the script or the movie. We're talking about like a movie that we all share and have in our heads, and we're all pursuing the same thing. Um, and just, you know, just to speak to that preparedness, the film, when you see it, um, has such a precision, there's, there's such a precision of composition in it that is striking right from the very, very first frame, so don't go in late. Um, but also, and this is just the, this is the last thing I'll say, that what I think is particularly amazing is that that precision is um, working with and sometimes against an extremely erratic, frightening family story, a horror story, where in terms of the script, anything could happen at any time, and things happen that you could never possibly see coming, and they just sideline you the way they do the characters, but you're always composing things in this very um, frighteningly um, detailed way. So that's just my way of congratulating you. And um, thank you very much for being here. This was a great conversation. Thank you, everybody else. For thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>